Okay, please go on. Um, so, hello everyone. Today, I'm going to present paper called Div uh, Divine Diverse Influential Training Points for Data Visualization and Model Refinement. Um, I only find the, uh, this paper in the archive and based on the format, I guess it's targeted at NIPS this year. So it is under the review of NIPS. Hmm? It is still under the reviewer of these NIPS oh, this year. I'm, I'm not sure. Actually. Okay, so oh, just I, to, I, to I didn't try it, yeah. mm, Okay. Um, the, the authors are from many from University of Cambridge and their research interests are focusing on uh, like machine learning, fairness, and transport. Oh, I think there are four authors. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I left one. Mm -hmm. And so the background of this paper is that um, training point is very important for the performance of deep learning models. And uh, also it's very important for reasoning about the model's behavior. But the question is how to find the most influential training points for a model. Um, so here we can begin with a motivating example. Um, there are three methods, one called IF, which is influence function. And the second one is called data Shapley. And the, th the third method is divine, which is from this paper. I will talk about those methods later, but here, um, the task is to find the five most influential training points in synthetic data and FNIMS. Uh, from, from the figure A, it is the synthetic data. Um, so the, the setting is that it's a binary classification problem and they sample the data from three Gaussian distribution. The top, the top one, the small group on top and the upper, upper right groups have the label of positive one and the, those points on the uh, bottom left have the label of negative one. So the decision boundary is the black line. And the, uh, the red diamonds are the points selected by influence function. And the blue, blue diamonds are the points selected by data sharply. Um, so just from this example, you can see the shortcoming of those two two methods is that they contain some redundant information. Those points are concentrated in some small region, whereas um, the yellow points, the yellow circle points selected by the line um, is, are much more diverse. And um, uh, well, the point here is that is there is diversity, the diversity really matters? So they claim that an explanation that contains diverse points is, is more useful. Mm. And then, because, 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 mm. so, so the follow-up question is that how they, how they define mm. the, the influence, the influence of training points. Yeah, yeah. We, we would, uh, later we would talk about that, but just- Yeah, I think based on, yeah, sorry about interruption. So mm. the comment here is that, uh, how to select the influence, uh, the inferential points is mm. basically de depends on the definition of the influence. So mm. I understand you can elaborate more later. Uh, let's keep continuing. Yeah. Here, just the point is that um, they wanted to select diverse uh, points that have a trade-off between importance and diversity. I understand. So the influence here, uh, oh, wait a minute. Let me. Uh, the point is that the inference and the definition of inference also depends mm -hmm. on the application we have, right? So uh, we can have a scenario of debugging, or mm -hmm. we can have scenario just understanding, right? That are all that is possible. 
So based on different scenarios, we will have different definition of influence. And the different definition of influence um. will further decide how do we select the inferential training points. So that'll be case by case. Mm. Uh, so in this paper, mm. do they provide a justification of the diversity? So under what scenarios, the diversity is really better? Mm. They have, uh, let me think about it. They apply this approach on one application to select uh, unfairness point. And they say that um, they can find more, uh, like more patterns where the, the points are are harmful for the model's fairness. Mm. Yeah, maybe we can go through more yeah. scenarios later. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we want to find the training points, you now we find there's a few noise noise data to make the training accuracy suffer, right? So in this case, I don't care about the diversity as long as we we, we pinpoint the noise data and then get rid of them. Uh, yeah. I don't care about the diversity, but for um, the, for the fairness, maybe the diversity really matters. And for advisory training, I think the diversity is also matters. Right. Let's keep yeah, the, I, they talk about it in the limitation section, actually. I think they said there are some applications where diversity is not the priority. But um, yeah, we, we can see more examples later. And for the glow, yeah, and for the second uh, data set, the F means data set, they show that um, the samples selected by the uh, divine is diverse, is are much more diverse, like the boot um, is not shown in. Uh, it still seems to me that diversity and the inference, they seem to be a trade off, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, let's keep going on. So yeah. maybe the contribution of this paper, what are you telling for uh, inferential spare points, but they want to select a more diverse, more diversified inferential points. Mm. Okay, keep going on. Yeah, so um, actually their contribution is that first they, they, um, they try to find a diverse set of training points that are more influential to a model. And then they find the scenario where um, to select unfairness points. So before we are talking about um, like select the most influential points for uh, model performance regarding to the accuracy or loss but here they evaluate the importance um, regarding the unfairness score and then they also conduct some exper experiments to show um, divine is able to select much more diverse uh, much more diverse points than other methods and last lastly they have a user study to show that the wine is to user trust and better test the new uh, legibility. Um, so we can start from some preliminaries, that is how to assign training points importance. Um, so we define the parameters of deep, uh, deep models as data. And then we also have a training data set not denoted by D, um, which has N data points and the loss function is uh, uh, is not denoted by L, which takes input of X, Y, and the model parameters data. So um, after training, the optimal parameters of these models is um, uh, just sum over the loss, which makes uh, the loss to be Minimize. And here the, the omega i means the weight for each training point. So here, if we have um, n training points, then the omega i for each for each data should be uh, one over n. So they have equal equal contribution. And one method to evaluate the importance of any training data is that um, 
uh, it is called leave one out method. So you can train two different uh, deep models, one with the whole training data set. And the, the other one is um, you, uh, you delete the, the ice training points and, uh, and train over the subset of data. And then the F represents loss function. So the important score is calculated by um, the loss score for leave one out model uh, minus the loss score of the original model. Um, is that clear? Oh, by the way, by the way, so the F is the overall loss, just the loss, loss value, training loss. And there's a. Well, but the point is that mm -hmm. uh, if we train, suppose the, the total number of data set is D, right? Suppose mm -hmm. we train on D and we train on half D. Suppose we. Not D, just, oh, uh, sorry. Um, so this model is trained uh, over the data set of D. Yeah, yeah. My mm -hmm. point my, my point is that. Um, if this is still a set, right? Suppose we remove half these the training samples for. We just here. remove one sample. Yeah, I understand that you uh -huh. try to remove one sample. And my question is, uh -huh. what if they removed half the sample? So in this case, the loss will definitely decrease, right? We can yeah. see this is a sum. So that means the more training samples we remove, the mm -hmm. smaller or the better the loss. So at least we're trying to, if I'm the one that- The loss person, will be normalized. Sorry. But this is not a normalized data, right? So this is loss. This, this part is the loss for an individual sample. And, right. you, you, and you add all the loss together. So I think at least we need to average it. Yeah, 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 and I agree. Actually, I found that there are a lot of mistakes in this paper. So okay, um, so maybe some... yeah, maybe we will be be more careful. I will be more careful to select the paper, uh, especially this archive version. But uh, the topic is quite related to our research. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Oh, it's okay. Um, but I, I also found that in their experiment part, they mess up with some figures. They copy the same figures. <laughs> so I think, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I think maybe, yeah, maybe this time they are really in a hurry, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, get a, to, to get a version done and some red nips. So good luck for these authors. Maybe it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a strong rejection. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then um, one question here is, uh, if I uh, the important score for the ice training points is positive, then uh, what does it mean? And so assume 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 it is an average, right? Assuming that the loss. Yeah, 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 assume it's average. average yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh 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 Yifan. Hello, Yifan. Uh. Uh. So that means we train we train a model without the ice training points and get the loss score. And then we also train a model with whole training data set and get the loss score. And then we um, we do a minus between them. So if, if it's posit positive, then that means after we remove the training, the ice training points, the loss uh, increase. Yeah. yeah. So, so what does it mean? <laughs> uh, that means uh, you remove some. Uh, you 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 don't you should not remove these samples. Is is it correct? Because after you we're oh, talking yeah. about we're talking about the inference. That's why I'm actually talking about inference. You can you can try to explain or imagine and, yeah. and how these samples. Uh, uh, what is the inference of these samples? Uh, 
Um, so leave one out. Leave one out. L O means that you, you, you. you what the? It means you remove the eyes training, uh, eyes training point. Oh, so after, yeah, after you remove the eye training point, you get a positive eye. So that means, uh, you, yeah, that means this point. Uh, I think sometimes maybe it's the outlier. So the loss is increased. Sometimes maybe mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. sorry, sometimes maybe it's uh, important. Um, actually it just, uh, the, the answer is quite simple. It just means the ice point is help, help, uh, helpful for reducing, to, for lowering the loss function. And if it's negative, then that means um, that this sample is Harmful. Negative is the that negative means the loss decrease, right? Yes. Then the loss decrease means that the model get better. No, I mean after you re, um after you remove the eyes turning points, then the loss decrease the loss decrease. Then that means yeah. if you add this sample, it's oh, I, I got it. Yeah. Uh, I got it. I got it. So if the negative, that means you should remove the sample. It's it's negative, it means, yes. Yes, so yes. that means, no, the negative means that when we remove, remove the simple I, the, the, the average loss decrease. No, the average, oh uh, yeah, yeah, decrease. Right, decrease. So, so, yeah. so it's good to remove it. Yeah, correct. Okay. Right, so, so that means the negative Ri means, um, means I actually is kind of hard samples. It will have a negative impact or mm. negative influence on the model. Yeah. And the positive AI means that it will have a positive influence on the, on the model. Mm. And, and yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. This, this part is it, it, it's quite clear. And mm. I think the philosophy is more like the Shapley value. I forgot who, who, who presented the paper of the Shapley value. Uh, it's Wang Chao, right? It's Wang Chao. Okay. Mm. I also checked data Shapley paper myself this week. Um, anyway, um, and then um, one, one state of the art method is called influence function. The intuition here is that if we try to retrain the model every time, um, if we try to retrain the model for each sample, then this this would be computationally expensive. So they, um, they propose to approximate the effect of removing a training point on the loss by um, reweighting its contribution. So pre previously we, we are talking about omega i means the weight for each training point. And here assume that if we wanted to reweight the contribution, maybe add um, epsilon i to um, to omega i, and if we set the epsilon i to be minus one over n, then that means we drop this training point. But in the general case, um, if we don't know the uh, if is it called epsilon? Uh, the uh, epsilon. Yeah, yes, yes, it, it, epsilon. Okay. Mm. And, and we can linearly approximate the parameters upon dropping xi. That means, uh, so this is the parameters uh, being approximate and it equals to the original parameters minus the Hessian matrix um, of theta, the, the inverse of Hessian matrix times the uh, the gradient of data with respect to uh, loss and then times epsilon i. So this is the conclusion from that paper and the Hessian matrix is defined by um, summing all the, uh, so here we assume the loss function is twice differentiable and summing all the, uh, uh, loss, 
with respect to each data. So it's a conclusion from that paper. Um, would you please uh, explain more about the intuition behind this uh, equation? Uh, actually, I'm not sure why to times the Hassan, the inverse of Hassan matrix, but from my point of view, um, this part is the uh, gradient of xi, yi, right? The, the sample. And then mm. you. Sorry, okay, so x, y, i. Because when you update the parameters, you calculate the gradient and then uh, and move and the theta, step. So the theta is the trend model, right? Theta, the theta hat is. Theta is the, the, the weight of the theta. Oh, the theta, uh, theta is the parameters, the model parameters. And the theta has already been trained. So, so we this add, one is the original model. Okay, okay, okay. So let's clarify that. I think here the explanation uh we go into your math. So I'm not going to write write that sentence here. Mm. So we're trying to say that uh, with or without i, so with so given a sample, let's call it xi and label yi, right? With or without these samples, and what is the, the trend theta? And the suppose the original theta is i, and mm. without without theta is theta tilde, right? We want to see the difference mm. between the theta tilde and the theta hat, right? Mm. So this is the basic idea we want to have. Mm. And the, the also saying that the difference or and here is okay. I'm going to using this notion, and mm. here we're going to rewrite it to the theta hat. Yeah. I, I, I F, right? So mm -hmm. this is what I, what I have. So they, they're saying that the theta hat I F uh, minus original theta equals a negative uh, function. Can you recall the gradient descent um, update formula? Like the state set hat should be equal to, like um, each time we see a turning point. Maybe, um, yeah, plus, the, the, plus the, 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 the gradient. Learning rate. Yeah, the learning rate times yeah, the, gradient. The learning rate times gradient, right? Just um, the gradient. Um, so here, in order to remove the, remove its contribution, we minus, let's say um, this is the learning rate. So we take a step back. And this is the gradient, but I'm not sure why they have to times the inverse of Hessian matrix. Oh, uh, I think it's something related to Newton method. Uh, Newton method is is like the second order of mm -hmm. uh, gradient descent. Like mm -hmm. what you're right is first order, but it's possible to have second order. But usually. Mm -hmm. Or not your second order because it involves computation of passing and reverse. Mm. Mm. But I, I guess there are some other like mathematical uh, formula in inside this paper. But mm. intuitively, you just define some like equivalent to learning rate the epsilon epsilon i and times the gradient. So you, you just take a step back. So you remove its contribution. It's just to remove the contribution in the last step or in all the steps? Just one, one step back. Mm -hmm. So the point is that uh, we keep trying to revert the contribution of high of, mm -hmm. of the sample i. The i trend, yeah, the i sample. But the problem is that when we update oh. the data, when we update the model or like oh. model, we're using batch normalization, right? We, we, we're training the model batch by batch. Oh. Training. Train the model batch by batch. So, oh, um, I remember I read something like 
in order to decrease the computational uh, ex uh, expense, they, they only train the model for one apple. Train the model for one apple. Then that means they go over each sample only once. So it means the batch size is one. Batch size? Uh, the yeah, no, 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 I'm talking about this. So let, 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 me, let me clarify the logic, uh -huh. logic flow. I think otherwise our discussion will go to the next. Uh -huh. um, if I understand it correctly, so the goal is that we want to estimate what if we do not have the sample I in the training data set, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Goal. And uh, we want to, but anyway, if we want to do this, uh, the, the most naive way is to remove the sample and retrain and retrain yeah. the model. So that is uh, so that is the most naive, but it is very expensive. Yeah. Now our approach is trying to do that. We want to have estimation to remove all the historical inference applied of this side. Um, yeah. Right. So that way, so that's why we want to reverse this uh, inferential or reverse mm -hmm. this inference in the history. Mm -hmm. So now come to question. So here I, I still have some confusion on mm -hmm. the equation, but overall the equation, what what, what does the equation want to do is try to eliminate all the inference trajectory when the way the trend model, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to reverse all the inference there. And uh, my question is that if we train an arbitrary model, uh, mm -hmm. we usually train it with, with batch, right? Batch by batch. Yeah. And uh, these samples must be in one batch and its inference is entangled with other samples to apply on the model. Mm. Right. So in this case, how can we uh, really remove this influence or? Mm, so it, it's just a linear so, approach. Yeah, yeah. So, so my question is that whether the origin model is trained by batch or trained by trained with batch, trained with a batch with its size of just a one. So um, can... they didn't mention this mm -hmm. in the paper. I'm not, I'm not okay, sure. maybe we can leave this part if there's someone mm -hmm. else can complement your vocal. Otherwise, maybe we can just believe this, yeah. just skip this part and we can have more of my discussion about how passing function uh, works in mm -hmm. these scenarios and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. how reasonable it is to approximate uh, mm -hmm. and how, how reasonable the, the approximation of eliminating SI's inference. Right. Mm -hmm. So this part. I but think, I think if you if you don't use the SGD the stochastic gradient descent, then the effect of. Uh, it, it for example, be, suppose the model has trained for maybe three hours. The model is trained by three it, hours. And so they only train it for one epoch. That means each mm -hmm. sample will only be seen once. Uh, but if we only look into one samples. Yeah. So what one epoch? Hmm. Is that really practical? And uh, usually the model is trained by usually the model is trained by thousands of epochs, right? So if we want to see whether how influence mm -hmm. how influential a sample it is, we try to revert it for at least for one thousand times to fully remove its influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe yeah, Rafa, I'm giving a link. I think we need to move on. And we do not mm -hmm. stick on okay, this part. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and remember that the uh, influence, the important score is given by um, the loss of new parameters uh, minus the loss of original parameters, right? So here we just apply, we put F on both sides and uh, conduct a Tyler expansion, I guess, and then you can get the this part. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah, and um, if you try to select M most influential points, um, you just sum over the importance score for this set. Then, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Mm. And then there's another method uh, called data sharply. Uh, Chapter value, and again, um, I I copied this part from the paper, but I think there are some mistakes. So I further look at the original paper. 
um, this is quite clear on the uh, upper upper right. So the idea here is that if we will remove any training points from the data set, and then um, you select a subset uh, as from the from the training data and calculate the let me see. So here B. Uh, how, oh, uh, how, what is the association? So the association is the association here or here? Mm. Oh, um, here. Okay, so let me remark it. This is here. Okay, mm -hmm. so the subset is uh, is from the from from the data. The rest of without, without data. yeah training data, and then here B is F, just F. So again, you calculate the um, loss of um um as with the training points minus without training points or without I training points. And this part is the normalized, uh, normalized factor. Yes. So, so they just that, it, yeah yeah I understand. It's, it seems to me a very computationally expensive problem. Yeah. So, um, so in practice, if you try to go or uh, go through every subset of D minus I, um, it would be computationally expensive. So in practice. They approximated five i by Monte Carlo sampling, so they just sample some subsets from d minus i and calculate the score. Mm. And, and and this function f is calculated with approximations, or the approximations introduced before, or was that the Richard model? Mm. Actually, I'm not sure. Or well, maybe, or maybe it doesn't matter. I only go through the high level idea yeah. of this. Okay. So, so anyway, we're just talking about. Uh, so let me rephrase it. So mm. the overall idea the, is called the data shapely. Mm. Well, data shapely it will not just evaluate uh, with or without samples on the training data. They will try to go through all the sub set of the training mm. data. Yeah. To see if we remove the sample in the seven data set and what is inferential, what is influence, right? So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. then we normalized all the all the subsets Correct. with with and with, without removing the samples and to have a by eye. And again, mm -hmm. this is a very computationally extensive process. So just Johnny mentioned, we usually conduct a more color sample to sample a limited number of a limited number of the subsets of the training data. With or without with and without uh, such these training samples to have an approximated mm. Mm. And And uh, so, have you checked about how the Monte Carlo uh, sampling conducted uh, yourself? Me, is it the you mean the code? Mm. I mean uh, the Monte Carlo. So, what, what is the rationale? So, can you briefly uh, share if you know what is the rationale of the Monte Carlo sampling? Um, yeah, basically we know that. It, so if I'm if I would if I'm the one to have a guess, Monte Carlo sample and trying to find the most uh, representative subsets, right? And uh, how does the sampling consider or define the representativeness? Uh, I think it's. Mm. Uh, Monte Carlo sampling. <laughs> just means that sometimes you need to calculate some expectation yeah. but it is it does not have close form so the only thing you can do is you you just sample from that function and take the sample average to approximate the expectation oh. yeah mm. so you want to sample uh so some, for, mm. for example you are taking the expectation of px but maybe this interval is hard to compute. So okay. you approximate by uh, some sample average. So so like let's say you you have an um you have a bias size maybe uh yeah I got I got a point yeah. so we cannot have a continuous interval so we sample from uh 
when we construct a discrete set uh, to calculate the expectation, expectation. Oh, yeah. and then my point is that how the sampling and, and how, how the sampling is conducted. I think the sampling money lies in this sampling of subset pi, right? Yeah, so um, yeah, my question is that how to sample the pi, the small pi in the big pi. Mm. So sample from all those possible. Yeah. Yeah. Random, the random, the random sampling or the random sampling or always do need to divide the, the space into divide the space. Or maybe, yeah. maybe here, yeah. So, yeah. I think uh, Xiaoming maybe can, or maybe Wolfgang can help uh, record it. I think for, for Xiaoming's this talk, there's a lot of the uh, important concepts we need to revisit. Uh, so, so in our in our talk, so for example, in Fan, the next week it will he will present another paper which has been presented before by you. So we try to we try to represent the, the the work because this work is very important. And some concepts we need to master the concepts to continue. So in this case, we have several points we need to revisit. The first is that the Hansen the, the, the Hansen matrix and, and, and how or why and what is the rationale based on what, what is the rationale and the which the inference can be can be reversed can be reverted right and the second is that this Monte Carlo sampling the, I think this is a very basic concept but I at least for me I have some uh, fuzzy uh, memory on this I think it's good for us to revisit the little concepts and they will be useful Mm. Okay, so let's keep, let's keep continuing. Mm. Mm. And their approach, the optimization optimization goal is quite simple actually. So first they have um, a predefined uh, M. That means we try to select um, a subset contains size of M. And then um, this is the important score. This is the diversity, diversity score. The gamma is just a trade of parameters to um, balance between importance and diversity. And overall, they try to maximize um, this function. And the important score is, I think they just apply one of the two methods we talk about. And for the diversity score, they introduce three different kinds of uh, way to measure it. The first one is called some redundancy. Um, so the K, I guess K is the constant and then minus, oh, here the, the phi is a, a radical basis function. So, so it's, um, it's this kernel. Um, oh, um, so the question here is, does this kernel measure similarity or distance? It's a good question. Um, I think Xiaoning is an expert to the question. I think it's good um, for an expert to raise the question. Wait, so maybe Rufan. Oh, uh, similarity. Oh, yeah. So oh. if the distance is equal to zero, then the kernel value will be one. Yeah. And if the distance is large, then um, the value would be close to zero. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So here we measure the similarity between any points um, inside the subset S. So that means we hope the similarity between um, any two points in S to be as um, as low as possible. So. The, the high level idea is we try to select some the um, M different points. Is, is that clear? So we, we wanted the similarity between points inside S to be as low as possible. Okay, that's good. Oh, and then the second method is called facility, uh, facility location. Um, so it tries to find the, um, it tries to maximize the average similarity between a training point and its most similar point in S. 
So, so we, we uh, go through every training point and then find the most, uh, it's most similar points in S and we try to maximize the, the value. And then for the third method is that um, it ensures that the M selective influential points are similar um, to the training data, but um, they should be different from each other. Okay. So for these three equations, which mm. equation do you think is most reasonable? Most reasonable? Um, I think the second and third method, uh, the, the first method only requires the, um, the selective points to be diverse from each other, but the second and third method finds, finds more like representative samples. I think the third the one is a combination of the first and second, right? Mm -hmm. am, I right? am I right? Or is a combination? So, the, first this, the, the second and third all consider training the, the other training data. So I guess they are more representative. But um, yeah, I guess the third one is the combination between the first and second. But in the main text of this paper, they consider the first one. Why? Um, they, they also did experiments with respect to the second and third in the appendix, but in the main text, they only show the results um, in the uh, using. So it, so it means that despite their three equations mm. and uh, the result may equivalent all comparable. Um, I, I double check their appendix, the results in the appendix. And uh, I think they are, they look similar. They're, okay, let's keep going on. And for the optimization part, um, so for the optimization part, they apply the grade, uh, grade selection. So that means first they, uh, first they calculate the influence score for every uh, sample, and then they initialize S to be an empty set. And then each step, they select one point from the training data set that can maximize um, the optimization goal, and then they add this sample to the app, and they um, they iterate this process until the size of S is equal to predefined M. And in this paper, so this is another paper that showed that this gradient selection uh, algorithm can achieve um, so at worst one minus one over E performance of the optimal set as star. And to st speed up this process, they also um, apply one, um, one method. That is, first they randomly select S, S points from the training data set, but S needs to less than M. And then they iterate, uh, again, they, they they could do this gradient selection to um, find um, other points until the, the size of S is equal to M. Okay, let's keep going up. There's nothing surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very straightforward. But uh, my only concern is that do they really um, got the correct result of the inference or correct measurement of the inference? Uh, what do but, you mean? But, yeah. the, the point is that uh, from our research, so when we read a paper, mm. we usually we don't care. Um, we think about how our research can combine with theirs, right? And whether, mm. and for this paper, it's more like our facility or library to use. So my, my concern is that whether this approach or whether there's a mature library has been published or can provide a reliable uh, facility for us to, to use. Because during the visualization, I think mm -hmm. how to highlight all the inferential samples for certain phenomena, it is mm -hmm. really important and it should somehow kind of be there. So if we can use them, so 
then it would be it would be it would be much better. And also, maybe I, I have my comments here is that uh, their approach only calculates the most influential input for a more accuracy, right? Um, mm -hmm. no, later they only they mm -hmm. also consider a fairness score. Okay, uh, yeah. So there, it can be customized, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about is there a way mm -hmm. to calculate the inferential matrix for an arbitrary phenomena? Uh, you got my point. For example, we say and you that, need to predefine the importance. Of uh, the yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. So that means the user can specify or provide an event. So when some event happens, so not like a traditional program. The traditional program said with a bug because I forget to check the non condition, mm -hmm. or because I write about there. So so this is a very very strong um, causality. Mm -hmm. And for deep learning models, the quality is more like association. It's more, there's a, I think there's a gray area between the association and the quality. Mm -hmm. So in this case, if we want to further investigate on how a sample is predicted as it is predicted now, we somehow need a more uh, vague kind of quality there. I think that is an inference. So for example, in our triple AI submission, Mm -hmm. uh, we say that the training points, a training point is screwed. It's a, it's the, it's the accuracy of a training point, uh, the, all, the, the training point is, cannot be accurately predicted anymore because we have some adverse sample there, right? So by right, uh, for, for, for current stage, we just manually identify its neighbor and to see how this neighbor how these neighbor adversaries influence the prediction of the test point. If it is possible, I think a better way is that we calculate the inferential score to find the most inferential samples in the model to which can cause the misprediction of the training sample. And I think that will be a more uh, interesting aspect mm -hmm. to investigate. Mm -hmm. And in our canvas or in our visualization solution, uh, I think they have a lot of other phenomena, so we can we can raise questions why this sample is misprinted, right? Or sometimes we can have questions of why this sample can be can be corrupted, or why the prediction of the sample can be corrupted uh, by involving some adversary sample queries. So this is all the cases of the inferential analysis. So I think that the inference the inferential analysis is very important here. Uh, but let's listen more about more detail. So, so if, if that's the case, and if inferential analysis or the sharp value or approximation is, is so important in our follow-up work, we need a very stable and reliable library uh, for duties, right? Okay, yeah, I, can, I can check their code later. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can take a note here. I think that is very interesting. So given the, so, if you think about it, given the shooters, we just find what we what what, what kind of samples we're interested in, right? So we want to have one step further. We want to see yeah. how and, and, and which events causing uh what we are causing the landscape as we see now, right? So I think the inferential analysis, the short period value set trust, yeah. I think can help a lot. But of course, the bugs may lie in the data it is. And also, they like the model architecture. They have a lot of effects. But I think if we're looking about the data perspective, uh, I think the inferential analysis will be important. Mm. Okay. But, but actually, personally, I think their work is not that ready. I agree. I agree. So, if it's ready, it becomes our mm. And then, um, yeah, here, one thing to mention is that in the previous slides, um, we select the most influential points from a global view. And they, they claim that this method can also be applied as a local explanation um, for individual points. So before we use the, um, the, the gradient of uh, all loads, but here um, in order to get the local explanation for one individual point i, then we can 
only look at the loss of ice points and then find its most influential uh, points. So J, J could be like, um, can you get the idea? <laughs> so instead of using the loss of all, um, of all training points, it only look at the ice point. And then- Yeah, yeah. I think this is, this is definitely, this is very relevant to what we discussed just now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how they um, okay. uh, get the okay, local- okay. okay, let's keep going on. Yeah, I think, I think this presentation just gave us um, a first step to look yeah. into this progress. And I think there's a lot of other, other aspects to discuss. And we can mm -hmm. have more discussion, more detailed discussions. And, and everyone will be welcome to comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and then, um, yeah, they take a step further. Instead of using the loss as, um, uh, instead of using loss for evaluating importance, here they define the family score to evaluate the importance. Um, so the formula is that, so um, let's say we have an uh, attribute A that have two, um, two options, A and B. To evaluate the uh, unfairness score, um, so they found, um, uh, they found all the points with uh, label Y to be J and uh, attributes to be uh, to be A, and with this means the problem, uh, the prediction of uh, Y to be J. And if it's fair, then P, um, then this value should be zero, right? Uh, by the way, is there any question for this uh, equation? I think this equation basically is very intuitive oh. and, a standard, and, a, and a standard equation for fairness. I oh. think the fairness is a very special kind of the adversary, but it's not a, a malicious one, but the fairness is someone we would like to really care about, especially the European countries care, care more about the fairness. Mm. Uh, like the the, the, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, especially for the visible minority, whether the rights of the visible minorities can be guaranteed, etc. Yeah, and so you can keep going on to oh. finish your uh, deliberation. And they also give a toy example <coughs> to show this. Um, but I, I think their paper is not that well written. The, the high level idea is that. Um, the the X and circle represent its label, <coughs> and originally they. Oh. Hmm? <coughs> so um, in the beginning we don't have this point, um, and then um, the color represents the um, the the in, in irrelevant attributes. So that means we shouldn't consider color. <coughs> so at first, um, the, pre, the, the decision boundary is this dash line and all points are correctly classified. And later they inject this um, erroneous unfairness point and then train the model again to get this solid line decision boundary. And then they calculate the uh, important, the most influential points with respect to F loss, F loss and F unfairness. And the result is that if the important measurement is F loss, then they would select this point. If the uh, measurement of F to be um, F unfairness, then uh, it will select this point. So they claim that if you uh, switch the evaluation, the, the evaluation of importance to be unfairness score, um, it worked because it did select this unfairness point. 
Yeah, but even if we know the inference, the inference, you know, we're going to do, is there any follow up action there? Yeah, um, the, the follow up part is the experiment. We, we should talk about them later. They remove those unfriendly points. And the point is that they wanted to check if you remove those points, if the unfriendly score decreases and if the accuracy. Yeah, I think this paper can hardly be accepted. Just yeah. yeah, yeah. I said uh, I said this to Dr. Shaw a lot of times yesterday. I don't think this mm -hmm. but but they do conduct a lot of experiments. The main uh, yeah, the problem I like think that if we want to uh, eradicate the fairness problem, mm -hmm. uh, we need to add some data augmentation to do this. So usually we want to Add more data to eliminate the fairness problem. Right. So, because you can think about it, some data does involve it does embed some additional information to help improve the model, right? So, I think it is very very brute force way mm. to just to remove them. I think mm. a better way is that we need to find a way to keep the most inform most informative uh, or keep the most informative but useful information. Well, get rid of the uh, unwanted information. So mm -hmm. I think in order to do this, we need to find another way instead of the instead of just removing it. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, they they apply the approach on those data sets and the f measurement um to be f loss and f unfairness. So first, we have already seen this um example before. So they just show that um, by using different gamma, there's a trade-off between the, the important score and diversity score. Um, um you want to remove the fair fairness. So now here the oh. F measurement is F loss. So in this slide, mm -hmm. they only show that um they only show the effect of gamma. So if gamma equals to zero, then um, it returns to a, the problem of only selecting the most important samples. But if you um, increase gamma, then the diversity of selected points, the diversity score of selected points would increase. And when we increase, uh, yeah, uh, when we increase the diversity, or when we improve the diversity, is there anything we need to pay for such a diversity? In terms of, so there's a trade off, right? The trade off between I and R, right? Mm. So my question is that uh, if we want to locate the inferential, the most inferential samples, we find those inferential samples are quite mm. clustered together mm. or there's a kind of duplication. But, the, but this duplication happens for a reason. Right. So, for example, there's a lot of the uh, professor, I don't know, maybe there's a lot of the uh, uh, folks of the race, the race, there's a lot of black people who have a, have an excellent performance on the racing, mm -hmm. on Olympic racing. So people will think the nation is not that good for it, right? So in this case, we try to remove that kind of the uh, bias. You are, you are still talking about the unfairness measurement, but- Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm talking about, yeah, yeah, whatever it is, whatever it is, the fair, fair, um, fairness or not. So there's a trade off between R and R, the yeah, differential yeah. and the diversity. So, mm -hmm. but the diversity, I think it does not that matter for the inference analysis, right? So you can see if we want to improve the reported, the diversity of reported samples, mm -hmm. we must pay something to or we must sacrifice the, the, the inference, right? Suppose uh, the top five inferential points are clustered together in fact, and if we want to improve the diversity, we have to get rid of maybe the first uh, some, maybe some other sam some samples in the top five and to select the top 10. So my question is that do we need to pay something for such a diversity? I I don't think they talk about that in this. Well, oh, that means when we have a diversity, and yeah. the, the, the very strange way is that if we look into the diversity, mm. uh, does the selected inference really, uh, or maybe 
if we want to sort of have more diversity, we remove some of the inferential points, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And if we retrain the model by removing what we selected, the models do have, can the model can have a better performance. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, but anyway, so there must be an experience for evaluating the trade off between the diversity and the, the inference, especially to see if we, especially if you have related benefits, if we include more diversity. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> um, you can go on with the slide, this slide. The only issue they really find something diverse. Um, so, um, so here the, the evaluation uh, function is the F unfairness. And they show that, um, so here they apply it in the, in this data set, the LSAT, but basically the um, A is sex and FYA is final year average score. So these two, those two properties should not be considered to, um, for evaluating GPA. And they say that because they try to find much more diverse points, so they find more patterns than uh, only than if you only look at the important score. Because here, the pattern is um, is that sex to be male and FYA to be pass. So this is the pattern they found. However, in this section. Um, other than this pattern, they also found um, this pattern. So they just claim that they can find more patterns um, where uh, for those unfairness points. And in this figure, they show that um, to, um, they apply a dimensional reduction and show that the divide points are much more diverse. And in this figure, um, is that they they put the samples into k clusters. So um, x x x axis is k, and y means how many points um, do they need in order to cover those k clusters? So divide um, requires this um, this point to cover those k uh, cluster. So again, it's the measurement regarding diversity. Okay, let's keep going. Hmm. And they show that, hmm, let me clear the, the drawing. Um, so in this experiment, they show that if they remove um, top, um, like top 10, top 20, top 30% of unfairness inducing points, um, what would the unfairness score? What, what is the unfairness score and what is the accuracy? So there are four data sets. So um, I don't think they have a good result because the optimal result is that the accuracy stays the same, whereas the unfairness score um, drops. But even so, the, the blue one is the divine method. And I don't see um, it surpass other methods. Right? Because here, the, the, green, the green one, um, I'm not sure. I just, I cannot read anything from their result. They're different. So the comparison is between the accuracy and unfairness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you remove so, like, remove the so top. it seems that if we remove uh, if we remove the approach, we remove the samples according to yeah. their approach, and the accuracy is keep going. Uh, to not drop, and mm. the unfairness score needs to drop. Hmm. Okay. Oh, it needs to uh, unfairness 
yeah, I need to draw. But just based on the results, I, I don't think I can see. Yeah, let's, let's keep these slides and then, yeah, let's finalize these presentations. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then in their user study, they wanted to ask the uh, research question on how useful these points are for explanation and for simulatability. And for the explanation, uh, yeah, the, uh, again, it's this example and they ask users to um, to evaluate how diverse are those selected points. And the, and the um, result is that um, divine samples are much more diverse than other ones. <laughs> and, and then, yeah. And then for the simulatability, this um, they wanted to ask how well a user can reason about an entire model given an explanation. That is, um, they show the most influential points using those um, uh, methods like random, if, and divine. And then they ask. A the user to draw the decision boundary. And they found that- Why ask the people to do this? You, we can draw a boundary based on the linear regression, right? So uh, SVM to do this. <laughs> but basically they only show that like the top and influential points. Yeah, 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 yeah that's- <laughs> And then they found out that the divine, the result of divine is the closest one to the true decision boundary. Yeah, but the point is that why ask people to do, to do, do this? We, just, we can just uh, using the machine to draw SVM to do this, right? No, they they wanted to claim that um, it can support user, uh, like that user to understand <laughs> the- Yeah, the point is that we definitely some user can do this, but first, if you're using user, you should bias. The second is that they just want to see their selected represent their selected inferential points are representative, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a very uh, object, there are very there are a lot of objective uh, measurement for mm. the representativeness. There's no mm. which complicated which complicates the uh, mm. studies, deduce a bias, yeah, and device attack. So I don't think this paper will be as mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's all. Yeah, so here, the final comments. I think, I think, there, I think when we read the papers, we, uh, so if we are the reviewers, definitely we will, it will invite a lot of attack uh, from the reviewer point of view. But if when we are reading paper and discussing this work, uh, I think we need to look into the quality perspective. Mm. Uh, I think one of the positive aspects positive aspect I learned from the paper is mm. that we it's better for us to using uh, using our own define our own inferential analysis to extract the quality. The quality may not may may, may not just for the user study, but I think they can strengthen our spatial temporal quality information uh, analysis in our own DEI project. You mean to define a mm -hmm. Customized measurements for the important. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether differential analysis can be first. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have two comments here. The first is that mm -hmm. uh, the, the inferential analysis is supposed to be customized. That means giving different phenomena or different uh, facts we observe mm -hmm. in the models, we can all we can we can we can calculate the inference. We can calculate the inference measurement for for any such customized and arbitrary fact. Right, so this is the first point. The second aspect is that the calculation must be very, very efficient. So I think the calculated value definitely is not the way to go because you need to calculate so many separate sets and to get such a measurement, it's too, it, it is far too expensive uh, mm. that we cannot afford. So in this case, if we want to support, uh, if we want to support our DDI with the inflation analysis or the quality analysis, uh, we need to have a very, very efficient and scalable way to, to calculate the instant, uh, calculate the, the, inferent, the inferential points uh, efficiently. Mm. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, uh, we can think of, we can think more about it. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Xiaoming. Uh, next one, how about uh, Yu Chen? Hi, Yu Chen. All right. Yeah, hello. Um, let me show my screen. Yeah, Xiaoming has uh, given us the uh, technical presentation, and this is supposed to be a tutorial. So I suggest everyone try to follow Yu Chen's tutorial, and we follow Yu, Yu Chen's uh, suggestion to see how to use it up. And uh, do we need to create some some repository by ourselves or? Uh, actually, it's not necessary. Yeah, I, I can just uh, show it to you guys. And then uh, later, if you want to reference it, you can just look at the repository directly. Okay. Yeah. So actually, um, GitHub Actions is a lot of just copying the templates. So yeah, there, there's, so don't really need to um, make the repository to follow along. Lah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just get started. Um, so GitHub Actions is a way to automate some tasks with, within the software development lifecycle. And it is basically event-driven, meaning that you can specify a series of commands to run after a event has occurred. And these events are GitHub events like the pull request, uh, a push, uh, issue, command, or a tag. So basically, this uh, event-driven system allows you to implement CI and CD. Okay, so basically, a GitHub action contains a certain numbers of workflows. So an event will trigger the workflow. The workflow itself contains jobs. And then each job is made up of a number of steps, and then each step corresponds to an action. And then these jobs are run by a runner. And this runner is basically just a machine that has the GitHub Actions runner application installed. So this runner will listen to the listen for available jobs and then uh, it will run one job at a time. And then it locks the progress and sends the result back to GitHub. So you can actually host your own runner if uh, you feel that your your actions you know, use a lot of uh, computational power or you think that it's not fast enough. And okay, so more about GitHub Actions. They use a syntax called YAML and, and the workflow files need to be stored in something in this folder called the .github slash workflows folder. And this is just a convention specified by GitHub. So if you have it in the wrong folder, it will not detect your workflow. And lastly, so the YAML syntax is uh, just a very simple markup language. And it's you can think of it like a JSON file. Yep. And let's give an example. So this is basically the whole file that um, you will write. And at the top here, we basically specify the name. So this name here refers to the name of the workflow, and that is actually optional. So we have the on keyword, and then we specify a certain series of events to trigger on. So as I said, this can be like your push and your pull requests and stuff like that. And then next, we define the jobs. So in this case, we have one job, and this job is called the check bets version, just as an example. And this job will have uh, certain um, attributes, one being like the runs on. So the runs on specifies the OS that the job will run on. And most of the time it's going to be Ubuntu latest. And then you specify all the steps that you use in order to carry out the, the whole workflow or job. Yep. So the first one we have checkout. So what checkout does is you can think of it as like a collection of commands that is already packaged nicely for you by GitHub or some community maintainer. And in this case for checkout, basically it allows your runner to have access to the files inside your repo. So almost all GitHub workflows will have this line here. And then in this case, we are trying to run some NPM project, right? So we also use another action called setup node. Oh, by the way, and so what is the SD2 mean? 
Yes, okay. So at v2 basically uh, specifies the version of the public action. So let me show you an example. So this is um, this is what an action would look like. And basically you can, this exists on the GitHub marketplace. So you can like look for the action you want and then you can add it to your workflow. So when they are uh, building all these uh, actions, right? They have several versions. And in this case for checkouts, they are on version two now. So depending on when you use it, you can specify the version and you can, uh, you know, have it more, you can use the older version if your workflow is requires it. Yeah, so this is just a extra parameter. Yeah, most of the time you just refer to the documentation on the action itself. Okay, so we are, we are here now and sometimes your action allows you to specify more attributes. Like if I want to set up node, then I can also specify the node version. So this setup node will give me access to the command NPM. And from then on, I just uh, write it as such. So I want to install something called bats. So I can run it like this, NPM install bats, and then I can run the bats like that. Yeah. Okay. so. Let's go to a live demo. Um, I basically set up a very simple Java Maven project. And yeah, so we'll, we'll see how to write a uh, action. Okay, so here I have a very simple um, Java project. I have an app. I have the main class here and all it does is to uh, define two functions, right? Just is even or is odd. And then I have a main method that prints hello world. And so in my test, um, I have some tests here. So the test for is even and the test for is odd. So right now all of them should be correct. And if I run Maven, yeah, should be Maven package this would run the test and compile uh, my application. Okay, so how do I make GitHub do that, right? So firstly, we'll start off by creating the directory, GitHub workflows. Oh, sorry, so I need to make it one by one, GitHub. And then I will create the workflow file. So let's call this a uh, build and test. So inside build and test, I'll basically uh, write, I'll follow some Maven template, right? So in this case, uh, let me go search for one. Yep, so it will just be like this. And the name of our workflow is will just be called Maven workflow. And then I want to do this on pushes. So every time I make a push, it should run this job. The job is called build and test, and then it runs on Ubuntu and it uses the checkout. And it also uses a uh, action called setup Java. So setup Java would give me access to Maven and uh, the Java compiler. In this case, I also specify the Java version that I want. Uh, I'll just use 14 for this. And then... By the way, so there is a trigger action. Uh, what if, is that, I assume that it supports multiple uh, triggers, right? So not only push, but also pull requests, etc. Yep. Yeah. So you can add more triggers like this if you want to um, yeah, start the workflow by these events. By the way, what if it is not, what if it is not a Java project? If, what if it's a Python or a, a machine learning and deep learning project? Yeah. So if it's for Python, then you would use something like uh setup Python, for example. Yep. Yeah. And then whatever, how, however you um run tests or benchmarks would just uh depend on 
how you want to use it. So for example, let's say um, I want to run pip install. So it will just be as how you use it um, on your command line requirements.txt, stuff like that. Yep. So I have a second example later on. Yeah, so as for deploying a approach, we still need to download a lot of files. For example, download the data set, download the sunset model, and, and, and that's all, and all those actions will be supported. Am I right? Um, not natively. I think if you want to if you want to download, uh, like basically make a whole ML ops workflow, right? There, there's, I think you will need other tools for that, which I have an example for a bit later on. Yeah. I think that if you want to do it like purely with scripts, it's also possible, then you wouldn't need that extra tool. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my last question for this action is that, and, and, and the GitHub provides us the server, right? Yeah, the GitHub yeah, yeah. provides the runner. Yeah, what kind of configuration? For example, if it is a deploying project, and whether it will be equipped with GPUs, and you know, how large is the disk? How large is the disk and the memory used? Uh, mm, I do not remember. I think, mm. I think you can find it if you Google it, but I don't have it at the top of my head. Yeah. Okay. It should be. It's it's quite a like, a uh, base base machine yeah yeah so so maybe but it, it provided can 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 it provide a uh i think a customized server right you mentioned that if it's a runner we can just link the runner on our own cloud or yep and this cloud can be uh but anyways this cloud need to be acceptable by the GitHub website. Mm, yes, correct. So that means if we want to have our own uh, CI server, uh, we still need to make it accessible to the uh, GitHub. Yeah, correct. Okay. Okay, so this is basically um, a very bare bones version for like the standard software do and test. And all we have to do here is to basically make a commit. So I will, I will commit it now. And yeah. So once that is done, it will basically start a job. So let's try to find, let's try to see this in action. Um, so I just added this, this item and you can see that there's a yellow dot here. So this is showing that there is some task, there's some workflow being run and we can check the details here. So. As you can see, we managed to pass setting up the JDK and then now it's running. And yeah, so everything passed. We have a green tick here, so we are done. And as another example, I have uh, previously prepared. So this is a case of a failing, failing test case. So in this case, I purposely made the test fail and yeah, so if the, the test fails, then the workflow will also fail. And we would actually want to block this from merging, right? So that's by actually way, one of the- By the way, if we have a commit, even if there's a build error or it cannot pass the uh, scripts or cannot pass the scripts, but it still allow us to submit, right? Uh, yes, yes, you can still make the push and yeah. So, Let's say that we want to protect our branch. We can go but, into the Git. Yeah, but what if, but what if, we, if we are in an enterprise? Uh, suppose I'm a technician, a senior technician, and there's a junior technician, the junior engineers, and I would like to set a guard. If those test case cannot be passed, and I will try to forbid their, uh, their submission. And uh, is there a way to do this? 
Yep. So we are right here. Um, we can specify branch protection rules. And in this case, we will add a very simple one. Let's say that um, we want to apply it to our master branch, right? So we can have many different um, requirements. Usually, uh, we would want a few approving reviews before you allow uh, somebody to merge a pull request. We can also require the status check. And in our case, we basically have a build and test workflow. So if so, by selecting this, we mean that um, we you can only merge if the build and test passes. Yeah. So once we create that, then it, this is in place now. Yeah. This this is for pull request or uh, push. Um, this is for pull request. Pull request. I think for push, you have to manage access. If I'm not wrong. So usually, unless you're added as a collaborator, you cannot push. I see. Yeah. Okay, so that's the basics. And some other features that you might see in um, other people's template is that uh, sometimes they'll reference uh, secrets. So, in, so a special secret is the GitHub token secret. And this one is generated automatically. So if you see other people using it, um, you can just copy it because every, every repo will have their own. Yeah. But in some cases, let's say that you want to access Postgres, right? And you have a username and password. This would need to be um, added into the repo manually. And where it's done is similarly also in settings. And then we go to this secrets tab here. Yeah. So all we have to do is uh, add new repository secret, and then this will be the key, and then in the value will be your uh, password or username, or maybe like a uh, API key. Yeah. Another thing that you can add in the workflow are environment variables. So this. This is just an attribute in a step. So you specify the environment and then similarly, you have a key value pair and then uh, yep, they are all case sensitive. And I have a question for the secrets. So can you specify more on how the secrets, are, what do those secrets are for? What the secrets are for? Okay, so um, this is usually used for deployment and uh, deploying to production. So we want to push like um, a compiled version of our application onto a server, right? Perhaps then we want to authenticate the connection to the server and then we want to like send the files over. And in this case, we want, we want, we will want to like specify how to access the like a username and password, like MySQL databases like MySQL and Postgres will also ask for a password when we when you want to do transactions and stuff like that. So in this case, we can keep it as a key rather than like having to enter it. Let's keep going. On. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I can find an example later. Okay. So yeah, so like Dr. Lin mentioned, um, for ML ops, the data will not fit into a GitHub repository. And the model is not really tested in the strict sense in that there are like test cases to pass. And I've been, so I looked into it, right? And my research brings me to some, this tool called DVC, uh, it stands for data version control. And it basically acts like a Git, but for data. And it allows uh, allows you to store and retrieve data from a remote server. In this case, um, this is apparently they support S3 and S3 is uh, implemented by a lot of cloud providers like Amazon and Google Cloud and stuff like that. So uh, this is mainly one. And then I believe they also allow like HTTP mode. 
So you can just like pull data from some server. Yeah. And they also version manage the changes to your data set. And they specify, you'll, you can also specify data pipelines, like um, cleaning the data and then uh, extracting the features before you train. So these are like separate stages. So you can define this pro programmatically and then DVC will uh, run all these stages for you. And it also, it also allows you to generate comparisons between the performance of uh, the model between the commits. And how DVC works is that it basically uh, creates like a hash or a metadata of the, of the data set. And then this metadata file is added into Git. So Git will manage the version control and then DVC will basically sync the version with the actual file. Yeah, so you can use DVC push and pull to store and retrieve data from a remote storage. You can also specify like hyperparameters and uh, metrics and plot data. So I'll show you an example of that later. But to be honest, I'm not super familiar with how DVC works. Um, this is mainly information from the get started page. Yeah. And so DVC is like a command line application, right? So you still need something to interface with GitHub. And this is where CM, CML comes in. CML stands for continuous machine learning. And it's another uh, application developed by the same people behind DVC. So CML basically just allows you to have uh, some commands to make it easy for you to interact with GitHub. In this case, we have uh, publish that uh, creates the URL for you and then send command. So this will send the report as a command inside your pull request. Okay, so let's look at how that would work. So inside here, I have an example file. Okay, so um, the, the project here is just a very simple uh, random forest classifier, something along those lines. And basically, if we run DVC repo, we can uh, run through all the stages in the pipeline and it will basically featureize clean and then train our model. Example, get started, right? And in this case, we can do something like CV, DVC plots div. And then this will actually yeah, generate uh, our performance, I guess. The, this is a file that uh, represents our test, test data, test results, sorry. So let's try to open that. Right, so DVC will be the one to generate this file. And what our CML and GitHub Actions will do is to generate this file on the runner and then ask CML to post the information as a comment. Um, is there any test cases to guide the performance? Uh, actually, no. I so, think okay. See, so that, that, that is just generating report. For example, the what is past model, what is, what is performance in the past model, and what is performance now, right? So we still need to manual manually evaluate, manually evaluate, evaluate. Yeah, correct. So in this case, it shows you the difference in the metrics that you used, and then the difference in performance. I think that if you want to create a guard, um. I think it's also possible. So you have to write some kind of script and then you basically let it run as a, another job. I see. Yeah, so I, I think it's uh, quite flexible in that regard. I think it's possible to, to do, yeah. And I guess I can just show you the example YML file for that. 
So, um, yeah, oh, so I've already cr created it. Okay, so I can go through uh, some of the attributes being used here. So we have actions checkout. And this one, as you recall, basically allows your runner to have access to your repository files. And you can specify the fetch depth uh, just to make the pool a bit faster. But if I'm not wrong, the fetch depth is already set to zero by default in version two. So this is actually redundant. And so um, setup CML, this is by this organization called Iterative. And setup CML basically allows you to run the CML uh, commands here. So we, we need to include this. And then we also set up DVC. And as you recall, DVC generates the plots. And uh, yeah, and it also generates like the different metrics. And of course we need to set up Python because the whole project is in Python. So yeah, and you can see like we, we need a repo token. So I think DVC needs this uh, repo token in order to run the whole project. And basically over here is just all the commands. We are generating the report by basically printing and creating a new file called report.md. And then at the very end, we ask CML to send this uh, markdown file as a comment. And that's how it appears over here. Okay. Um... Yeah, I think that is basically what the CI CD for traditional Java Python program and the ML program, right? Yeah. Yeah. So can you leave some on? Um, so one thing I would like to, I think you can get a very perfect and a clarified presentations. Uh, but anyway, so it, it's not like a paper. When we look into the paper, we just talk the ideas from a theoretical uh, perspective. But this is a really practical problem. So can you leave uh, uh, more like a assignment or homework? So you can leave a few pointers for the people and for the students to try to follow. And I suggest that we uh, follow all the examples and we've gone through once and they must be have the problems. When we have the problems, you can, we can raise the questions to you and you can, uh, you can suggest and advise and how to fix this problem. Mm, okay, so mm. I actually have uh, prepared a quiz at the very end. Okay, uh, so you you you're planning, uh, what's, what's, what's your plan? Oh, so you still have one demo and one, one quiz, right? Uh, yeah, actually, that's, we reached the end of the demo already. So I have okay. mm. a little bit more information about the usage mm. limits. Okay. And yeah, then after that, it's just a quiz. The quiz is planned for, we do that now or we do that? After the oh, we do it now. Yeah. Okay. 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 So for usage limit, um, this is just like of the very basic ones. I think that we should take note of. So, the limits are actually quite high. Also, so uh, we are not really afraid of reaching the limit, but it's good to know. So the job has a runtime of up to six hours. And each workflow has a runtime limited to 72 hours. So a workflow can have maximum 12 jobs queued together. And sometimes within the job, you might want to issue APS, uh, API requests to some services outside. And this is capped at 1000 per hour. And the concurrent jobs is I think most of us has a pro plan, right? So it will be 40, but the maximum Mac OS jobs that you can use is only five. So a job matrix is uh, something like in the case where we are specifying the version, I, I believe some actions allow you to specify a list of versions. So this allows you to test your program on different uh, programming language versions, and this will create a matrix. 
So this job uh, matrix is referring to that, and then there's only a maximum of 256. Yep, and that's uh, the bulk of it. So is there any questions? Yeah, actually, I think like for standard um, standard programs, the CI-CD workflow is very simple. So you just set it up to run your build to test or build command. And but for, but for deep learning and stuff, I think there's a lot more setup to be done. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other tool apart from DVC, but I this seems to be like the more the most flexible and uh more widely used one. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no questions, then we can play a Kahoot quiz. Okay, so. You can you can join it at kaput.it and then this is our game pin. Okay, so I suggest everyone try it. Have a try, have a try for the quiz. So this quiz is not a practical quiz, right? Just to spread the knowledge, just to yep. check check whether we have graphical or 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 you mentioned. Okay, we can just send a can you send a link in the chat? Okay, um, yeah, there and there. Link. Uh, and by the way, there's a student whose name is Lu Zhen Ye. May I may I ask uh, who you are? Sorry, I forgot the name here. Hello. Oh, sorry, it's a wrong year. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. So your name is a little bit uh different. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you can mute yourself and and enjoy the quiz. Okay, so, so you're still waiting, waiting for us to start the quiz, right? Uh, yes. Is there any more participants? Actually, we can we can start if you like nobody else wants to join. If I would like to join. Yeah, Ken. I think you are already inside. So yeah, we are all in the. Yeah, yeah, but I see there's some students, still some students who uh, not join. Uh, you found that have a try. Or Changshu would like to have a try. Yeah, maybe let's wait for one more minute, then we start the quiz. Okay, sure. Uh, sorry, maybe in this time, can I ask a question? I'm, I'm a little bit confused that um, why we need, I mean, CMI, CV. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit, because I, this is the first time for me to see such action for GitHub. I'm, I'm really confused. It, yeah. Right. So, um, you can think of DVC as like an abstraction over the storage and retrieval of the data set. So I imagine if you want to run your deep learning model, you would have to like download this data set first and then you run your, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the problem is that you can't store this on GitHub, right? Yeah. So you need something to basically pull the data. And that's where DVC comes in. Oh, yeah, because so, previously, if so, I, I, will, I will choose, I, I will not pull such data. 
Okay, I think I got it. Mm, yeah, so DVC uh, manages the data for you and also uh, I think it helps you run the, the project also, like it starts the pipeline. And then CML uh, mainly helps to collect the report and then post it on GitHub. So I think, yeah, so if you only use the this kind of commands, right, you don't have a way of uh, locating your repository and then like making the API call to uh, open a new comment. So CML helps you do that and yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, maybe it's a time for us to have a quiz. Okay, sure. Quite interesting. Yeah, so usually for access credentials, you don't want it to be stored in a repository where people can find it. So you want to hide it behind the secrets. And actually, the, I have a story of uh, my friend who was at the internship and then somebody else basically saved the username and password in a file and then he pushed the commit. And I think within 10 minutes, there was some bot using their uh, AWS servers to mine Bitcoin. Okay. So, yeah. So um, with regards to credentials, like it's, it's better to store it in the secrets and not as a plain text file. Yeah, so five is correct. Darren did a quite a good job. Yeah, so uh, the GitHub's token secret is invisible to us, actually. You can just assume that it is there and it's accessible uh, like uh, I, this. I, I remember that the GitHub tokens, we still need to key into the key and a value, right? Uh, no, this one is automatic. This is the only exception. So... Uh, Let's, I, I think I have it somewhere here. Yeah, this is the only one that is automatically generated. And, mm. and, and then the second option that I how to specify, how to specify the own secrets. So, and how are these two questions related? Um, I think this is just talking points. So they, they are separate. So, how do you specify your own secrets is to go to the settings, inside the settings menu and then uh, under secrets and then new repository secrets. Okay. Yeah. And these secrets is actually in plain text, right? Um, yes, yes. But it's uh, stored in GitHub. So it's like not public. But I still need to provide a secret uh, when we submit the scripts. 
Yes, depending if your scripts use them. So um, let me try to find an example, right? I think I have... Um, Right, so in this case, let's see. Yeah, so for example, if I am trying to uh, access my data from AWS, and this is like a protected server, then I would have to specify what my key ID is and what the key is. So that um, the runner that is running DVC pool is able to pull the data. Oh. Yeah, so in this case, you want to have a pool where you, that means the, the script.key ID and script.key need to specify when we submit such a request. Correct, yes. In a plain text. And we need to, can, do we need to store those ID and keys into, the, uh, into a document? Yeah, don't need, don't need. Don't need. So yeah. all the server will ask the question. Sorry? But when we are trying to pull the data set, from the AWS, and how the how the server require those secrets? How the server require the secrets? I think it is all handled by DVC, uh, within within their action. So, that so means we this... have to specify the information in DVC. Yes, yes. In, in, I think in, DVC in a, a plain text. Um. It is invisible to the people trying to read the repo. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure what the... So basically, we create the secrets, right? And then we can access the secrets. And then in within the job, we create the environment variables that contains the secret. So when DVC runs, it reads the environment variables. And... I don't think anybody is able to access the secrets within the runner's container. I see, I see. So basically, they are all stored as environment uh, variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an environment variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so next question. Good job, Darren. Mm, yeah, so it's workflows with a S. And actually, these things can be a little bit hard to debug, but uh, I, I don't think there's any way other than to just to make sure, yeah. Mm, yep, so I think there's no confusion with this one. Um, the publishing of the results is done by CML. The file changes is handled by Git. And then running the integration test is used by um, your Maven or whatever build tool. And then CML generates the comparison plots. Yep.
Mm, yes. So uh TensorBot is like the wild card here. Um basically if the tool is popular enough, there's probably an integration with GitHub and GitHub Actions and the tool. So for TensorBot, yeah, it's over here. So TensorBot is part of CML actually. Yeah. yeah, so for commits, it's not really a event because uh, GitHub does not know when you commit, you make a commit. Um, yeah, so it's mainly from push and pull requests. But GitHub Actions is very, like the supported events are very big. So there can be like new issues also. You can use that as a trigger. Um, when you fork, when somebody forks your repo, that's also a trigger. But it's all, how to say, like it's all events on GitHub and not Git. Yeah, so uh, this is false. Okay, so this is the last question. Yeah, so the answer is actually the other way around. The steps are comprised of actions. Hey, by the way, who is JD? It's me, it's me, Junbo, Junbo. Okay, Junbo, good job. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I suggest, right. yeah, I suggest uh, all of, <laughs> yeah, this is very funny uh, uh, animation. So yeah, I think uh, Yu Chan, since Yu Chan, you did a very, very good job to preparing this quiz. And maybe later we can follow something similar, follow the similar styles to, to do this. And uh, yeah, maybe we can organize more activities like these. And also I suggest all the people to follow Yu Chan's tutorials and try to practice yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. for for the continuous machine learning i recommend the getting started for cml over here yeah yeah so i think we need to it was one to spend some time to understand some basic concepts mm. Mm, okay okay thanks you chen maybe you can call it a day yeah mm. is there any questions for you chen or xiangling for their uh, technical presentation Okay, if not, let's call it a day. Bye, everyone. Bye.